West Florida Public Library presents Explore Pensacola History, a lecture series highlighting more than 450 years of Escambia County's history. Join us as we explore the people, places, and events that make up our area's unique heritage. Major funding for Explore Pensacola History was provided through a grant from the Florida Humanities Council with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording do not necessarily represent those of the Florida Humanities Council or the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the Friends of West Florida Public Library, whose ongoing generosity provides these and other first-class programs to the people of Escambia County. For more information or to become a friend of the library, visit them online at friendsofwfpl.org. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be with you all tonight. And um, as part of the continuing series here, we, we look at how we look at our history and heritage in many different ways. And there are many different ways that we can learn about who we are, where we from, come from. And I think part of that is uh, kind of helping us to realize who we all are as Floridians, because many of us may not have been born here, but we certainly live in the state of Florida and uh, we are today Floridians. And uh, we do not just spring um, uh, onto the landscape with no heritage attached to us. We come and live, we live in a uh, community that has a very rich cultural heritage. And we read about that in many ways. Today, we're going to talk about what we can discern from the cemeteries that we have from our historic cemeteries. Now, the picture that I'm showing you up here is um, uh, from uh, over in Purdue Hill, Alabama. It's over on the Alabama River. Um, I don't know, have many of you ever been on a cemetery trek where you have gone into the woods to look for a cemetery, for a gravestone? Into the woods. Um, well, many of our historic cemeteries that uh, uh, are outside of urban areas often look like this. It might not be something that you would actually uh, realize was even on the landscape of the community. Uh, the little town that this was associated with, Claiborne, is no longer on the historic landscape. But the funerary architecture that is within this little wooded patch of ground is rich in meaning and it reflects the lives of the people that lived in that community from about around 1820 until about 1845-1850. And so it, like many of the cemeteries that we have on the funerary landscape of our communities, um, contains a lot of information. And tonight, um, I have some images from here, but I'm basically going to be talking with you about St. Michael's Cemetery and about uh, Magnolia Cemetery. And uh, these are two cemeteries in Pensacola that give us a lot of information about um, Pensacola over time. Now, for those of you, nobody really raised their hands if they have gone into the woods. How many people have gone into the woods? Okay, into the woods, because next slide. I have an assistant here. Uh, before you go into the woods, I always like to start this because before you go um, into uh, go any place, if you are someone that's out gathering information from cemeteries, uh, there are a couple of things that you just want to remember. So this is just like our upfront um, little blurb for safety. Uh, first, you do want to have permission if it's not a public site like St. Michael's or like Magnolia. Uh, but it is, say, in an isolated area. Often it's surrounded by private land. So you want to have permission before you go over somebody's fence and into their cow pasture. And uh, so you want to make sure that someone knows where you are going, uh, that you have someone with you, that you've got your cell phone with you, that you're dressed appropriately. This is not the time for, to have on your uh, Birkenstocks and your flip-flops. You want to have on tennis shoes and have on uh, pants so that you are not in a position of hurting yourself. Um, you also uh, want to take appropriate equipment. Uh, you want to leave the Clorox bottle at home. You want to leave the shaving cream bottle at home. You never want to apply anything to the surface of a stone to get information. You want to take a photograph of it. And there are many guides that will give you a good, that, a good uh, way in which to do that. But you never want to leave a trace that you've been there. You do not want to do harm. You want to gather your information. Do not 
lean up against something and knock it over and break it and have it fall on your neighbor's foot. Um, so you want to, in going into a cemetery, be very aware of your surroundings and record your information, but leave no trace, just as you would if you were hiking in our national parks. Let's go to the next one. Now, um, I like opening with that first slide because landscapes change. And what you're looking at here, we're, we're going to look at landscape change in Pensacola. Um, when the area around St. Michael Cemetery, and you can see it right here, it's a little postcard, and here is St. Michael Cemetery. If you'll notice, this is surrounded by vast urban development. But when the area that is, we know today, the, the enclosure, the eight acre enclosure of St. Michael's was first uh, used as a burial ground, the area, it was in the late 1700s and it was not enclosed. And uh, we see it represented on several colonial maps, uh, particularly on British colonial maps initially from the 1770s. And we see it first maybe as just a little letter, uh, as a legend on the map. And then we also have maps that just show the little crosses and uh, uh, all around the area that they're using as a cemetery. And as you can see here, here is downtown Pensacola. This is the colonial community. And you'll see this uh, little stream system that surrounds it. And so this is the stream system that surrounded the colonial community. And the cemetery was outside of the city limits, so to speak. You would have had to come out of the, the area of uh, settlement, cross over a bridge, believe it or not, that went across this substantial creek bed and then go and turn into the cemetery area. Um, those creeks have been filled in today, so we don't see them on the landscape, um, but they uh, were definitely there and they were substantial. And we've seen archeological evidence of them down uh, out in the street in Alconies in front of the uh, IHMC building uh, have documented the, the stream bed path. Um, so in order to get to the cemetery, you would have been outside, you would have gone outside of town. Now, much of the material that people were using to mark uh, grave sites in the 18th century in Pensacola uh, were perhaps wood. Uh, often you would see wood crosses uh, that have, um, that were used in these early sites. Uh, they don't, nothing like this survives in our climate. You all know, know what happens to the, anything wood attached to your house or your yard. So wood does not survive where, very well. They were also using bricks a good bit because we did have uh, access to clay. But we don't have any marble here. We don't have any um, stone quarries in our area. So they would have been using what they had, which would have been wood and it would have been brick. And often we see the, the wood um, deteriorates and no trace remains of that. Bricks often crumble and they're often recycled into other uses. So um, people would have been burying their dead outside of town and likely marking them in ways that did not leave a permanent footprint. Um, but definitely, oh, and by the way, this is uh, Bio Chico over here, just to give you a little reference. This is Bio Chico coming up. And um, so what, um, what you're looking at here, uh, this is, we're moving up North Hill. This is the North Hill area up over here. Um, and so the cemetery is right at the foot of uh, North Hill, right outside of town. And, um, and you can see there's several little paths. That, that run along, and this all comes into play. It's not like you're gonna have a quiz, but we do have a slide where we're gonna be looking at those. Let's go to the next one. Um, we have had great success at the Archaeology Institute in um, reconciling the colonial landscape, the colonial maps that we have to our modern landscape. And we have a great deal of success down in the colonial community down here because they were divided into lots and um, it was a very specific survey. Once we get outside of town, it gets a little bit squashier, so we're not quite as, as uh, pinpoint, but I pointed out the little creek bed. What we're looking at is the modern city, and you're seeing an overlay that shows where the, the stream was that surrounded the colonial town. Uh, you're looking uh, at this street coming out right here. This was, for the British, this was Charlotte Street. It then became Alconese. Here's crossing a little waterway right here. And you'll notice what you have here are roadways. And these go over to the east of town, most of them over the Bio Tahar where there were some brick kilns. And then you'll notice all those little crosses that we were talking about. This is the approximate area on the modern landscape where all these little crosses should be. 
The little E you see here, uh, in 1778, this is the uh, spot that was marked by the British on their maps as the burying ground. These crosses are from a uh, 1781 map. Now, you may say to yourself, where is this on today's landscape? Um, the early uh, colonial cemetery that we see here um, likely had been long gone from what the visual landscape between the British, the second Spanish, the early American. Things fade away. Also, it was not like people had access to these early colonial maps from the get-go when they were doing urban planning in Pensacola. Um, so it's not been until about really maybe the past 20 years that we've had really good access to the colonial maps that tell us these things. So uh, we don't have any indication of burials in this area um, from anything that we can find that has to do with urban development associated with, with building the Civic Center, putting in the interstate, but certainly there likely are burials outside the perimeter of what we know of uh, today as modern downtown um, uh, Pensacola's St. Michael's Cemetery. Now you can see the eight acres that is the cemetery today is dotted in right here, uh, but you can see a larger green square and when St. Michael's was first actually delineated, when they, when they actually surveyed it, um, they surveyed it in 1810 and they set aside 25 acres for a burial ground. And of course what we have today in here is Aragon and this is the Tech Park up here. Now we've done extensive archaeology in the area over here as these, uh, this parcel of land was being developed and we've not found evidence of burials over there. Um, but, uh, so it may be that they just were really um, planning ahead with what they were doing, but primarily what, what we're seeing are burials in this area. And while there will definitely be burials outside this area, this is what we have today uh, that remains of that initial burial ground that was laid out in 1810 as a formal enclosure of what was being used as a burial ground. Um, and uh, as you can see, the roads going through, pay attention to these roads again, because we're gonna talk about them later on, uh, because I have a mission for you. Next one. Um, again, with landscape change, when you go into a cemetery, uh, take the time to look around. Actually pay attention to where you are and just look around. And in particular at St. Michael's, I like to tell people to just let the urban landscape fall away from your mind and let yourself go back. Let, let yourself think about what this site would have looked like. Now, this is not that long ago. This is 1897. Uh, and you can see from the picture above what a dramatic change there is in the landscape of the cemetery. Uh, this picture was taken um, and it shows Mrs. Pfeiffer right here. And then here is one of her descendants, Mr. Pfeiffer, right down here. The picture was taken. We think there's another above ground tomb that sits right next to this. And we think the person that took the picture climbed up on that tomb and stood on top of it and took the picture. We did not do that because that would not be good practice. So what we did was take a ladder and try and position it so that we would get somewhat of a similar perspective. And um, so you can see that in the late 1800s you had a beautiful overstory, the, just a wonderful canopy of oaks. You can also see that the cemetery was filled with picket fencing and these were enclosures just like you enclose your front yard. These were the enclosures for the family plots. Um, styles change over time and so while we see part of the original fabric, if you'll notice right here, you've got a marker right in here uh, that uh, is, and you see the down here, you can see the above ground tomb here and it's just peeking out right here. Up here we see this marker and it is right down here. And, um, but what has changed about this? You know, there's not one picket fence in St. Michael's Cemetery. There's nothing that survives, and that's why these photographs are very important to us in documenting sites, because they give us a view over time of changes, and they help us keep up with things that might not be on the landscape. Uh, and of course, the picket fencing is one thing. And one reason the picket fencing fell away is because we saw the introduction of a new style. Now, we all know, both men and women alike, that we are not likely wearing the same style of clothing that we wore when we were teenagers. Styles change over time, and we adapt to those style, uh, stylish changes. And that's happened in the cemetery as well. One of the changes we see is the introduction of metal fencing. 
So once you see a trend that goes toward, uh, let's get rid of those picket fences and get us cast iron fencing. That is the new hot thing. And so we see a big change. So in St. Michael's, we have many examples of the uh, cast iron and um, uh, molded iron fences, um, and, but we don't have any, any of the wood that remains. Let's go to the, the next one. Um, also, when you're walking, don't, don't just look at the funerary landscape in terms of what the markers are. Again, look all around you. Uh, in St. Michael's Cemetery, I, I would su suggest, and this is walking in on the North Road, if you were walking along this road and just looked down at this, probably your first impression would be weeds. How are they going to get rid of those weeds? And, um, but they're not weeds. Uh, we, we, in St. Michael's, there are over 450 different species of wild grasses and wildflowers that grow. And uh, oftentimes, people have talked about, let's turn these into parks. Let's make our um, cemeteries parks. You don't really want to do that, because what matters about St. Michael's is that in the heart of the urban environment, we have eight acres that while it has been disturbed in terms of interments, it's not been disturbed like the urban environment outside of the cemetery. So this is probably one of the last places we have in the city where we can identify species that were growing here when Europeans came. So it's very important to hang on to the botanical landscape that, that, you, um, that is original to your site. And that's next. And um, just to give you a, um, another uh, insight, they're often introduced botanicals. Just like uh, styles change in cemeteries, people say things with flowers. And in St. Michael's, we have over uh, 80 clumps of a, um, a, a, a bulb called the Jamaica crinum. And this was a very popular funerary plant uh, from the um, late 1880s into about 1925. And so people were planting these um, next to their markers. Uh, sometimes all you have is the plant that survives, and it's often a um, clue that there's a grave there. Uh, if you've got a, a botanical that's introduced, and here's what it looks like peeking out from behind this marker. Uh, but it's a uh, really beautiful funerary plant. It came from West Africa into North America. It's great for cemeteries because it's drought resistant. And I am telling you, you cannot kill them. Um, the, um, that is true. We did, uh, in, for the 450th, we separated uh, some of our clumps. We did not remove them all because you don't want to disturb the planting. Separated them and we sold them. Uh, as part of our 450th um, uh, anniversary as a fundraiser and raised $9,000 for the cemetery for maintenance and conservation. So um, you want to look around and see what's growing there. Let's go next. Um, you see evolution in styles. Um, the box tomb that you see here is in St. Michael's. This is a built up uh, brick box tomb. It sits up off the ground about three feet. It's got a marble ledger that fits uh, across the top of it. And if you'll notice, uh, there is a heap of information on this tombstone. Someone hand carved all of this information about Captain Jerison on here. So you are going to see a lot of information about him personally. Uh, we don't see that so much anymore, but something similar that we've seen up in Monroeville, uh, and this is a machine carved granite ledger that uh, also has a commemorative marker on it. And there's a lot of information on here. I like to show this because this is a, gives you a real idea of kind of an evolution of style and of what technologies were available. This was carved by hand. This was carved by machine. This is marble. This is granite. We did not see the introduction of granite into our cemeteries until the late 1800s. The reason is it's a very hard stone, and they did not develop a method in which to cut it effectively until the late 1800s when the diamond bit saw bit was developed, and they could actually cut granite. Uh, and then we see a big shift from the marble to the granite. Um, that became the new trend style. Let's go ahead. We also see uh, in the markers a lot of expression that you might not think about just normally. Um, 
when you go into a cemetery, and if you're a genealogist, you're often looking for the name, you're looking for the dates, you're looking, maybe you're going to find out something about where they were from, um, but you are, are looking at a name. Uh, here we have a good bit of information because we also have, um, it's, it's almost like a little secret language that's going on in the cemetery. Again, uh, we start to see in, in the early Victorian period, um, almost like a quiet little secret language of flowers and symbolism. And so when you are in the cemetery and you see swags of flowers, there is a meaning to this. Um, for Fanny Dade, uh, she has a whole drape of flowers here and that really um, translates into love and beauty. Uh, so there is almost like a word and then a translation for what it means in the Victorian expression that we see. Again, she has a marble marker. She's 1848. Uh, a, we're going to see a shift in style when we go come over here. We've got 1905. And what you see here is a combination of marble, hand-carved uh, marble at the top, and then we've got granite. And this is a really wonderful um, marker in St. Michael's Cemetery, and it's also a wonderful story of the American um, you made it uh, in terms of uh, pulling yourself up from uh, and building your life in America. Uh, this gentleman uh, is from Italy. He came uh, to uh, America as a young man, and he started off pushing a push cart of fruit and vegetables on South Palafox Street. And he built that into a wonderful wholesale business. When he died at 55, he was very respected in the community, uh, had a big house uh, up uh, at the start of North Hill. And um, interestingly enough, the man died of typhus in the middle of a yellow fever epidemic. And uh, so he, um, he really, you're, you're seeing an expression of someone who has really done well for himself as an immigrant into, um, uh, coming into our country. Let's go next. Um, you're often uh, seeing influences that you might not think about. Um, the obelisk that we see just dotting the landscape, and you'll see them in almost every cemetery that you go to, was really inspired uh, by Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. This became a really um, wonderful expression for um, uh, Europeans and Americans alike. And I like using this, uh, this one. This one's up in Monroeville, but you will, in St. Michael's, we have a number of examples, and so does St. John's Cemetery. What you're seeing here is almost like a forest of them. Um, the whole cemetery is, uh, is composed of these, uh, just about of these wonderful spires. Um, a lot of what we look at, too, in cemeteries are trade patterns, um, and we look at every bit of the stone we can find. Um, this one uh, is also from um, up in Monroeville, and in looking at it, you, you can obviously tell that we're broken uh, here and in need of repair, um, but this particular stone from 1840 um, also gives us a lot of information. Uh, we have her name, we have who she was the daughter of, and uh, he was in the military there. Um, she died of congestive fever in Claiborne, and you have something that you always want to look for on the stones, aside from the information that you're seeing here, and that's a carver's name. The person that made the stone, especially for marble stones, they're generally going to be signed. And they're going to be signed down usually in the right-hand corner. It could be over in the left-hand corner or on the back, but as a rule, you're going to find it right down at the base of the stone. You never want to dig down looking for it, but you will uh, often see it uh, right uh, at the uh, top uh, if the stone in particular is uh, mounted on a base. The transcription, this one was one that was um, in a um, uh, file online uh, for Alabama graveyards, and uh, the transcription of the carver down here, they transcribed it, and so online it reads J and then R-I-E-R, and then in Haben, Connecticut, or CT. So who, who this actually is, is Jay Ritter, who was a carver out of um, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, he came, um, uh, his work is seen all throughout uh, the Black Belt area, and it shows us a nice progression of trade patterns. And um, we have one example in St. Michael's Cemetery, uh, of his work, but these stones were moving in and out. This was part of the commerce of the area. Let's go, next one. Um, in looking at carving styles, sometimes you are not able to see the carver's name. It might be broken off, but if you are, are underground, but often you're able to um, 
find really strong similarities. And in this case, right up here and right over here, we're looking at, um, in a memory, and we're looking at almost exact same script style that you see here. So these were likely carved by the same man, and the man they were likely carved by was a carver out of Mobile. And uh, so you, sometimes you can see similarities that are going to help you um, even find a little more information than, um, than you might think just in uh, how the carving style is, is on the stone. Next. Um, the economics of death. Um, sometimes we, we walk through the cemetery and we might not think that um, economics has anything at all to do with the cemetery, but I can assure you that it does. Um, this is the Hunt tomb in St. Michael's Cemetery. Mr. Hunt was in the water-powered mill business up on um, uh, Blackwater, and uh, then he later transitioned uh, and transitioned into brick making, and he was a very affluent, well-to-do man here. Uh, when he died, his tomb was constructed by a carver out of New Orleans, Floyville Foy, and his, the tomb is marked right down here on this pillar, uh, with the carver's name, and um, we fortunately have uh, part of the um, records from his estate, and uh, in 1851, they paid $4,300 to have this um, above-ground tomb made for him. And so if you want to put it in relative dollars, depending on what the stock market's doing, um, it's around 100 and, what, 30, 31,000? Um, so if you stop and think, this is one site in St. Michael's, think about eight acres of marble and stone. And what you're looking at is actually a very big collection of funding in one spot for almost all of these cemeteries. Next. Um, you're often able to find on uh, tombstones uh, things that you also might not think so much about, and that would be uh, perhaps what the person died of. Uh, this one to me is particularly interesting. Uh, this is a victim of yellow fever, uh, and often it's hard to find yellow fever victims. People were not keen on uh, putting their um, uh, putting out in the public that they died of yellow fever. Not, they didn't even really want you to know they were having a yellow fever epidemic uh, because it discouraged people from coming. Um, our last epidemic was in 1905, and this is of course following the, um, the actual determination of what caused yellow fever and the development of a vaccine. And we see uh, this vanishing from um, our modern life. But uh, on this tombstone, um, it does indicate that he died of yellow fever. And uh, he was in Pensacola in 1868. And uh, you have to wonder why. Um, he was uh, obviously uh, with Northern forces during the war. So you wondered, was he stationed here? Was he stationed uh, when Union forces held uh, Pensacola and then perhaps came back? Um, but what drew him back? And this is a, uh, um, this is a marble, uh, a gray marble marker. And interestingly, it's, the orientation is north-south, so I don't know what to tell you about that. Uh, but um, Mr. Reed um, has a lot of information that's available from his tombstone, and so always look and see. Sometimes they'll give you um, a, a, um, uh, a cause of death that uh, will be associated with the, uh, with the tombstone. And let's go. Um, look at the crosses as well, because often the cross has a story to tell. And uh, what you're looking at up here, uh, this is a cross in St. Michael's. This is in the Priest Mound in St. Michael's Cemetery. Uh, this is Father Fullerton, and he was Irish. And this is a Celtic cross that you see here. Um, this is one uh, ran across in uh, California, Napa Valley. Um, and a lot of Russians came over uh, in association with the vineyards, with establishing the vineyards. And here we have Russian Orthodox. So take a look at what the expression of the cross is. And again, take your camera, take your picture, and then you can look at your picture and you'll be surprised at what all you pick out just from your photograph. Take pictures up close of things so that you are not squinting at the big picture trying to think, oh gee, what was that? It seemed so clear when I was looking at it. Um, so take several pictures so that you're able to look at your stone from a lot of different angles. Let's go next. Um, sometimes you don't have uh, quite so obvious expressions of faith, and this again is in St. Michael's. And if you look right down here, you'll see this little collection of pebbles that are right down. And this is, uh, comes out of the Jewish tradition, um, and you will um, often see pebbles that are left 
uh, on the site. Uh, and this is one reason why you never want to pick anything up in a cemetery. Never pick it up and think, oh, I'll put it in my pocket. What does it matter? It does matter. There's often a lot of symbolism tied up in what is left behind. And uh, so we never want to disturb anything that we see in a cemetery. Let's go to the next one. Um, you often see, and this is over in Magnolia, you'll see a lot of vernacular expression in the South. And we certainly have great um, ex expression going on here in, in Pensacola. Um, have any of you ever been over to Magnolia Cemetery? Wait. How many Magnolia Cemetery visitors we got? And it's here in Mobile. It's here, right here, Magnolia over on A Street. Magnolia Cemetery on A Street. All right, and I should have asked early, how many of you have actually been to St. Michael's Cemetery? All right, so we've got a lot of St. Michael. Well, on your next trip, I would suggest that you go and park your car over on A Street. It's at A and Brainerd. And uh, maybe take a stroll. Watch your step. You for sure want to have on the correct shoes and watch where you're walking. But this cemetery is a beautiful example of turn of the uh, 20th century African-American vernacular architecture. And uh, if you walk in there, you're going to see uh, the Goldstrucker tomb. This is above ground tomb. And it um, uh, looks like the very formal architecture. We have several examples in St. Michael's uh, that um, have the uh, uh, vaults, the individual vaults, but this is made, usually vernacular architecture is made by local craftsmen and artisans. It's made so that it has a formal style feel to it, but it's typically made with local building materials and it's made uh, by local artisans and craftsmen using what is available to be used. And so the Goldstruckers, um, this, uh, this family actually had a, um, a taxi service, a funeral taxi service here in Pensacola. And they provided the cars that took many of the uh, members of the black community to the funerals and uh, to the cemeteries at the time. There was also, um, I don't know if we were the, uh, the mothership or if Montgomery was, but there's a Goldstrucker family firm in Montgomery that also was providing the same services. And so uh, here you see uh, we have um, uh, this one is uh, they just used a tool to actually put in the wordage here and uh, whereas you've got a more formal presentation up at the top uh, using, you know, probably materials that were locally at hand. The same that we see down here. Uh, this is, they might not have carved flowers on this tombstone, but if you look right up here, you have this wonderful expression of a flower right up here. And right down at the bottom, not sure what this is. It looks like a T, uh, so I don't know if it's the letter T for their name. Uh, but it is a, um, uh, this is a, uh, you know, it's got tiles, it's, been, it's using tiles and what could have even been bathroom tiles, uh, kitchen tiles that we see worked in here. Uh, and then the marker that you see over here, this is poured concrete and they've pressed pebbles into it to spell out the name and the date. And there are a number example of examples over there that are absolutely beautiful. They're wonderful to look at. Um, the, um, and likely, again, these are made by people that were active in the community at the time. Let's go. In the modern uh, symbolism and vernacular expression, I, I'm sure we've all been to cemeteries and we've seen markers that are very similar to, to this granite marker for the Mercer family. And so for the moment, I, I want you to kind of shut one eye and let's block this out and let's go right next door to this little marker right over here. Um, and this is a marker for a child. And if you look right in front of it, you'll see the shell. Um, shells are often found in cemeteries and um, we interpret, the, interpret them as cultural markers. We often see them in association with Indian and African burials, African-American burials, people that come from that uh, tradition and will often leave shells. And again, this is why you never want to pick anything up. Uh, for years, before this marker came along, uh, this little marker right here in St. Michael's, we always thought perhaps this was someone that came out of the African-American or Indian tradition because of the shell. But it was not until the fam Mercer family came in to put in a marker, uh, the um, father was already buried and unmarked here, the mother 
uh, died in 2001, and they wanted to put a marker in. And um, the it, we met the family, and indeed they come out of our tri Creole um, community here in Pensacola. And this is one of their uh, one of their family, one of their family members. And um, if you look at this, you know it tells you a good bit. You've got a piano and a saxophone, which is a pretty good indication that, that perhaps the mother and the father were musicians. Uh, they played these instruments. Um, and you've also got you've got a nickname on here. You've got Wallace C. the Cat. Mercer. And so who you actually have here is Wally the Cat, who was the first African-American DJ in Pensacola, and he was a jazz musician who played the saxophone. And um, so one of, uh, so you actually are getting a lot of information just as you do on these really early marbles. You can, uh, you're also going to find it on the modern uh, funiary landscape. Let's go to the next one. Um, in some cases, you're not going to find a name and you may think, well, you know, this is a dead-end street. What can I know about this person? Um, this is actually probably my favorite tombstone in St. Michael's Cemetery. And it's, uh, Mother is Gone But Not Forgotten. And uh, this is a great example of vernacular architecture. This is a molded, poured concrete. It's in a formal architectural style. And it tells us actually a good bit. Uh, we know that uh, what the material is made out of, we have the gender, we have the family role, we have religious affiliation with the cross. We can pretty much assume that this lady was Christian. Uh, we have the symbolism, which is the dove. What her family wanted to say about her had to do with her purity and her peace of mind or her peace around her. Um, socioeconomic standing, this is likely not someone that was particularly well to do in the community. Um, if you'll notice on here, we have a couple of errors going on. Rather than start over, they corrected them. And uh, so it is, this is not a piece that would have been particularly expensive to put in the cemetery. Um, the year of death range. Um, I'll tell you about this, we can, you know, you would look at this and you obviously have no date, but here again, it goes to keeping a keen uh, eye on where you are because we have almost the exact same marker over in Magnolia Cemetery down here. And this was being made by a uh, local craftsman and he was making tombstones over in uh, Magnolia Cemetery. Uh, or, or a group of them were of this particular style using this particular stamping um, and they were doing this between about 1918 and about 1935. And um, we're working on who the artisan might be um, and uh, working with members of the, uh, the community to try and identify who perhaps was making these markers over in Magnolia because it was somebody in the community uh, likely associated with uh, the church and in the building business. I've been driving all over Belmont de Villers uh, looking at many of the architectural styles in, um, the, uh, uh, in Magnolia because you'll often see the building materials incorporated in the buildings uh, that you see in that neighborhood. So you'll want to keep an eye out. Um, I also, I, I want to, in using this thinking, most people don't think about cemeteries probably as archeological sites, but they are. Every marker in a cemetery is an artifact. This is the last artifact that a family has left behind about an individual. And it, just as we look at every potsherd and um, every piece of um, material that we recover uh, from um, below the ground, we also look at what we have on the surface. And so you want to think of these cemeteries as archeological sites, and that is certainly how St. Michael's Cemetery is managed and overseen in cooperation with St. Michael's Cemetery Foundation, which is the primary steward for this site. Um, so you want to think of it as an archeological site and as a historic site. Uh, for St. Michael's Cemetery in particular, not only is it on the National Register, but it's also on the Florida Spanish Colonial Trail. And this is a trail that the state of Florida has throughout the state that connects visitors and our um, uh, community as well to sites that tie us to our Spanish heritage. And uh, so it uh, is a, uh, we, we have a lot to offer here. And in Pensacola, not only at um, the oldest cemetery that we have that survives, which is St. Michael's, but through time, uh, looking at the development of cemeteries from St. John's on coming through to Magnolia, we 
have a wonderful opportunity here to have the same type of trail system that just looks at our historic cemeteries because we have wonderful resources. Next. Ah, now um, I want you all, the next time you're downtown knocking around, a couple of things. I want you to actually go to St. Michael Cemetery and I want you to enter the south gate. This is the north gate, but I want you to enter the south gate because you're going to be walking on an extant colonial era road. When you go into St. Michael's on that south road on Alkanese, you are walking on a colonial roadbed. It's been protected up in that cemetery because it's been in the middle of a cemetery. But take a walk in there and let things drop away from you. You also might want to come to uh, All Souls Day in the cemetery, which is at six o'clock on November 2nd. And this is a beautiful, beautiful service. Um, it is one that has been a tradition in Pensacola um, since our second Spanish period, and, uh, likely is one of the oldest traditions that actually survives from the colonial era into our modern community. So I would say all of you um, come to this really beautiful, simple service in St. Michael's that takes place at six o'clock on the second. We're also offering walking tours on Tuesdays and Fridays at one at 10 and one at two, and there's no charge for this. And so you just come and show up down there on the South Road, that's where it's gonna start. Um, and one of our graduate students from the university is leading tours, uh, and this will take place uh, through mid-December. So take advantage of it and carry yourself off down there and go on a tour and uh, look at what you have to see uh, in the cemetery just based on what we've talked about tonight. Um, St. Michael's Cemetery is a partner with the Viva Florida 500 Initiative. We're a very proud partner uh, with them and um, many of our events uh, for the public are structured around Viva Florida 500. We do want people to come and take advantage of what we have. I hope that this gives you a little bit of a different insight when you go into a cemetery if you're doing research or if you're just walking around and enjoying your day to look around you and see what can be reflected about your history, your heritage, uh, the people that lived in the community where you live or where you're visiting. A uh, lot of information to be had. So hope it gives you a, a, a little encouragement to strike out. So I hope you go to the cemetery and I hope you come here banjo music on Saturday night. Thank you. <laughs>